Hello, good afternoon. My name is Andrea. I work for uh, GeoSolutions. Uh, today we are going to talk a bit about uh, WPS and uh, spatial processing in general with uh, GeoServer. Uh, some historical perspective on why I'm doing this presentation today. A few years ago, the things that people were looking after was publishing a map, uh, ma maybe do some styling, some filtering, maybe time elevation based, maybe do some uh, WFST editing, some PDF printing, and that was all. It was all about getting the information out. That is still being done, but uh, what I've noticed during the last two years is that we can hardly make a new application, new web application, without having some bits of processing into it. Now, basically every kind of application GeoSolutions is making today has some kind of spatial analysis, even if it's maybe simple. Sometimes it's very complicated, but it seems that it's kind of unavoidable to have some spatial processing in a modern application. And uh, so I put together this presentation to talk about uh, how you do it with WPS and GeoServer and SQL views, and to provide some use cases where we uh, had some significant experience with WPS and SQL view and share it with you. So some quick reminders about WPS. The presentation is not an introduction to WPS. It's a, a presentation about how we use it. But anyways, just quick pointers. WPS stands for Web Processing Service. It is the OGC specification to do any kind of spatial analysis, any kind of calculation, actually any kind of action, because WPS is totally general. I could write, write a process to send an email or to order a pizza if I wanted to. It doesn't have to be spatial, but normally it is, right? Um, so this is an example of a request. A request is normally it's an XML document that you send. Um, this is kind of the simplest one you can think of. Um, throwing a, a geometry, an L-shaped line, I'm saying, OK, buffer it by two pixels, by two meters, whatever, and I get the result, which is a polygon. This is kind of the simplest process you can think of. And from here, it can get as complicated as you want. WPS has two execution modes, and it's important to choose the proper one when you are developing your application. There is the synchronous mode where the client asks the server to do some calculation and sits there on an HTTP connection waiting for the result to come back, pretty much like a, a get map in WMS. I want the map, I get back the map. This approach assumes that the execution will be fast, which is not always the case when I'm doing processing. A spatial analysis can take hours, can take days. So the other approach is to do an asynchronous request, which is an optional part of the WPS protocol, but your server supports it, where you ask the server to do some kind of processing, and the server gives you back a token that you can use to check the status of your processing. Is it running? Is it done? Can I get the results? So you, you make polling against the server to check what's the status of the request you made. And of course, this is suitable for, large, uh, for lo longer computations. Something specific about GeoServer. This is kind of the common WPS setup in the OGC. Uh, from the OGC point of view, a WPS is something that does processing, but it does not own data, not necessarily. And you get data from other OGC services. If you need getter, vector data, you get it from a WFS. If you need <coughs> raster data, you get it from a WCS. Or you can get it from whatever other HTTP server that is around on the net but you have to fetch it from remote normally. Then you do your processing and uh, send back the results to the client. GeoServer has more uh, functionality because it's an integrated WPS. That is, the WPS is part of a larger environment where I have data sources, local data sources. I have the ability to configure new layers and so on. So, GeoServer retains the ability to, to talk to remote services, but very often you want to talk to layers that you are already ex exposing via GeoServer, so you go directly to the data source. So I don't do a WFS request, fetch the GML, parse it, and so on. I go straight to the PostGIS if I need to. I go straight to the shapefile, to the GeoTIFF file that I have locally. Um, we have integration with the WMS, which is called the rendering transformation that allows us 
to take a style which instructs GeoServer to transform the data on the fly while rendering it. So we don't actually store anywhere the transformed version, say contour line extraction, we do it on the fly, we paint the contour lines, and that's done. And we have a, a nicer integration with the UI in that we have a sort of a little client, which is not a proper WPS client, that uh, allows you to build the WPS request, which comes in handy if you are, a, I don't know, a JavaScript developer that wants to build uh, a request without having to type all the XML. Uh, this builder will build the request for you. So if, you, if your WPS usage comes to setting up maybe a complicated request once, you can have this tool do it. <coughs> this is the rendering transformations that I was talking about. Contour line extraction case, heat map extraction case. So from point data to raster data, from raster data to line data. And uh, rendering transformations are very nice in that uh, they are not just uh, applying the contouring or the heat map on the data that you have. They are context sensitive. They are actually working just on the area that you're looking at with the WMS. So they don't process the whole data set, but just the part that you're looking at. And they are resolution aware. So when I'm extracting these contour lines, I'm extracting at the resolution that the user is looking at, not at the nati native resolution of the digital elevation model, which speeds up the process tremendously and makes it possible to use interactively. Writing the processes can be done normally in Java, but it's also possible to use uh, uh, scripting languages uh, such as Jython, which is Python version for uh, the Java virtual machine, Groovy, JavaScript, Ruby, Scala, and a few more. So you're not bound to extend and write new processes in Java if that's your, not your language of choice. You can write them with a scripting language, which is also nice because you can have your running your server, you throw at it your script and uh, a new uh, WPS shows up, a new process in WPS shows up. You want to change it, you do it, you don't have to restart the GeoServer, so the development goes faster. Uh, now, we could say a lot more about the GeoServer WPS, but uh, we don't have the time in these 20 minutes. I want to show you a bunch of examples, a, a bunch of significant examples. A few years ago, uh, Denver, Phos4G, I made a presentation about uh, WPS, which goes in detail about which processes we have uh, built in, what they do, and uh, all the detailed capabilities of our, our WPS. So I want you, if you're interested, to have a look at that one. Now, WPS is not the end of all things. WPS is meant for processing, but it's not always the best choice. You never have to forget that if you have a uh, spatial database as the data backend for your um, for your infrastructure. Well, the spatial database is an exceptional platform for doing spatial analysis as well. It has a number of abilities to uh, intersect data, to compute buffers, and so on within the database. And sometimes it makes a lot of sense to just do the computation right there because it's faster. So. Uh, Besides that, uh, spatial databases are very well suited for the classic select, aggregate, and filter, and join uh, routines that every database does. They, d they do it very quickly. It makes no sense to get, grab the data and have process it uh, in, uh, in uh, Java or JavaScript and so, and so on if the database can do the, the computation for you. It's already there. It's functionality that uh, you don't have to pay for. Uh, so. How, you, how do you uh, interact with the, uh, the database? Well, GeoServer has this SQL view concept in which you type an SQL in, in the GeoServer user interface, and GeoServer uses that SQL as the data source. So you can do joins, you can do computations in, th in, uh, in that SQL. And GeoServer just runs that SQL to extract the data. Plus, that SQL can have parameters that you can pass down from the client to alter the functionality of the SQL view. So this is more or less how it looks. From the client, you can pass down, say I have a, a low and a high parameter in my SQL view. The, the client gives values to those parameters. Your server expands them into the query, sends the SQL to the database, 
retrieves the results and then displays them as WMS or returns them as WFS. Uh, there are certain limitations that you have to be awa aware of because we are basically replacing strings into an SQL, so we are open to SQL injection attacks. So there is a validation bit that you have to add to make sure that no strange things go into your SQL statement. OK, and this is, uh, I'm done with the theory. Now let's go down to business with some examples, some real world examples where we used this or that capabilities of, of WPS or SQL views. First application that we developed, FAO Tuna Atlas. The Tuna Atlas is a, a web application that has this grid. Uh, each cell of the grid is actually a historical data set of all the catchments of various kinds of tunas with various kinds of uh, uh, fishing technique. And uh, uh, this application uh, allows you to select uh, a range of years. Uh, it can allow you to select a range of quarters of the years if you want to. Uh, the type of uh, um, fishing that uh, is being done and the species, one or more, of uh, tuna that is being catched. And basically, it shows you an aggregate map of the sum of, of all the catchments that happened during that time with that <coughs> technique and, and, and that kind of tuna. Now, what do we have here, really? We have multiple type of filters, a word close. We have an aggregation, select some something. We have joining, uh, because the quarterly stats have to be joined with the uh, spatial grid that we have here. It's nothing that a database cannot do, right? It's just a query at the end of the day. And that's what, what uh, actually powers that map. We have a, an SQL statement with some parameters. Here, the operation, it can be sum, it can be average, and we send it down from the client, depending on what kind of uh, aggregation the user wants. We have uh, other parameters here to select the, um, the, the fishing technique, the years, the quarters, and so on. And every all, all of these are coming down from the client, from the user interface in JavaScript that we, we showed. Uh, Oracle runs on the fly. In this case, it's Oracle. Runs on the fly. This query, which has nothing special, returns the data, and GeoServer displays it. And that's it. And if you wanted to select a different uh, range of uh, uh, of data and so on, we just have to change the parameters. So this is processing, yes. But it's so simple that can, it can be turned into an SQL query. And that's how that web application works. So no need for WPS for this one. The most efficient way is actually to have the database run it. On top of it, uh, if we select a number of years, we can have uh, uh, the web application produce an animation showing the evolution of catchments among the years. Instead of aggregating them, summing them, we can show by year or by quarter a frame in animation. Uh, so we have uh, this way to control uh, this user interface, to control how the animation is done. And then we have a tool in GeoServer which is called Animator, which basically does many get map requests, assembles them into an animated GIF, which is then returned. Uh, again, some sort of processing without actually having to do uh, anything with WPS. Um, now, this is a PDF. The, uh, this map is not moving, but uh, in the real application, you would see the catchment change year by year and quarter by quarter. So this is one first kind of application where we have done processing, but we haven't touched WPS at all. Now, let's go uh, to another uh, application that we have been developing, download services which instead uses WPS. Uh, now, the, the requirement of this application is pretty simple. The user wants to uh, look on the map, select some layers, uh, select an output format, and download the data, plus some extra. Some extra about uh, clipping the data. The user can draw a polygon. Can uh, Let me see. Yeah, this is the user interface. The user can do, uh, draw a polygon. It can ask for a buffer around the polygon, if necessary, to 
enlarge the polygon it was uh, that was uh, uh, drawn, it can uh, uh, draw a polygon or select uh, data from a polygon layer. So maybe I'm downloading by province or by county, and I can select the county instead of having to draw the exact contour of it. And, uh, and then uh, the idea is that I can download a DXF, a KML, a shapefile of this area for the selected layer. Now you might say, OK, this is a job for WFS, no? It's a way to extract the vector data. And if uh, we, we can also choose a, uh, a raster layer, that would be a job for WCS instead of extracting raster data. There's a catch, though. The extraction can be massive. And WFS and WCS do not have an asynchronous mode to operate. What if the extraction takes 20 minutes? The web application will time out waiting for, uh, for the download to be available. Besides, we don't want the uh, user to have to sit there all the time. Uh, what we do is actually ask the user to input uh, an email address. And uh, when it's done, we send an email with the download link. Now, here we have. Some simple spatial processing, clipping, right? And uh, we wanted to take some time to, to do the, uh, the execution. So it's a job for WPS in a synchronous mode. Uh, the only thing that we do in synchronous mode is the buffering. The user draws the polygon. If it asks for a buffer, in order to display the buffered area, we call in a synchronous way the buffer process. So we send this polygon to GeoServer and your server sends us back the buffered version. Okay? But this is the only synchronous part of this application. Uh, instead, the tracking the download status is done via async WPS. Here we have another twist which makes things a bit more complicated. Uh, we need to be able to use a cluster of GeoServers, so a cluster of WPSs, and uh, which means we need to know what's the, what the status of the execution is regardless of the server <coughs> that is actually executing the download. So we had to make a, a bit of customization to GeoServer. We created, of course, a download process that can do all the clipping and selection and reprojection and all. And uh, we replaced uh, a pluggable part of GeoServer, which is called the process manager, so that the status of the execution can be shared amo among nodes. The default one. Uh, uses a local thread pool and does not inform anybody about uh, the status of, uh, of the execution. We created one that stores the status in a database. And we created a little extension so that when the, when the process is done, it also sends an email. It actually sends multiple emails. It sends one email when the uh, extraction of the data begins and one email when it's done or when it failed to inform the user. And it gives it uh, the, the download. And, uh, and the uh, client, which is called the Map Store, which is, by the way, another open source project that we are developing, does a number of calls to WPS. One is the buffer. We already talked about it. It's a synchronous call. It can do a download estimator call, which is another process that custom that we developed, which uh, allows us to uh, estimate how long it will, uh, how much data will be extracted, because we have limits on it. We don't allow people to extract. Uh, 10 gigabytes of data out of the data sources. So the da download estimator is a quick way for the client to, to know whether we are within the limits or not. Then we run the download process, which also computes the limits itself for security reasons, in case a some somebody tries to dodge the user interface. And the get status, which is used to know about the current status of the, uh, of the uh, process, process execution. Oops. And display it here. OK, so, so this is a case in which we didn't touch the database, no SQL views. It's pure WPS, but uh, with a twist. It's asynchronous, and we actually had to tune the GeoServer a bit to allow it to work in a cluster. Let's see another case in which we had to mix a bit of WPS and a bit of SQL views in a sort of ingenious way to solve a problem of large data uh, processing, the destination project. Now, the destination project is a, is a funded project from uh, uh, the northern Italy. 
I won't uh, go too much in detail, but the idea is that we have this road network, we have these trucks carrying dangerous goods, petrol, gases, stuff like, uh, stuff like uh, that could uh, harm the population or the environment in case of accident. And we wanted to compute in some way the uh, risk of, uh, uh, for, the, for the environment and the population associated to the each arc of the road network. The road network of the northern Italy is actually split into 50 meters arcs, and we have statistics about uh, the average number of ac car accidents happening in those arcs. Then we mix it with the, uh, the environment that's around, so hospitals, buildings, uh, that, that is generally speaking places where the population can gather or live. Uh, indications about uh, the environment, uh, uh, for example, water and stuff like that. And uh, uh, we have a, a notion of the area that could be affected by a certain kind of accident, depending on the kind of substance which is being carried around. It can spread out quickly or, or not. So we have several buffer areas that can catch uh, the portion of land that would be affected by, a car acc by uh, an accident with a truck uh, transporting dangerous goods. So the, the data volume is relatively large. We have, uh, sorry, it was 100 meter portions, but we had, the thing is we have uh, 500 thousands of them to cover the Northern Italy road network. And then we have a, a second level of aggregation just to have a bit of multi-resolution so that we don't have to paint the 100 meters segments always. When we are zoomed out, we can go for the 500 meters aggregation. And we are, when we have are even more zoomed out, we switch to polygons, one, one kilometer uh, cells. We have 51 different buffer distances depending on the uh, scenario, uh, uh, what kind of substance, and uh, uh, whether the scenario is, uh, I don't know, a weekend scenario plus a weekdays scenario because a certain kind of targets are more vulnerable. Th that is, they have more people during the weekend versus during the working days. And uh, we have uh, several types of targets, both human and environmental. This makes for a, a, a large amount of computation. Plus, the expression that we have to apply to compute the total risk is this huge set of aggregations. Now, <laughs> um, what we are adding together is it's uh, more or less the things that are already uh, explained about, so the um, in, uh, accidentality, types of goods, uh, human environment, and so on. And uh, uh, the scientists that want to look at this data and the decisioners that want to look at this data also might want to have a look at partial results. So not the total risk, but uh, some parts of this aggregation. So we have uh, an O plus, plus uh, a number of coefficients in there can be tuned by the scientists at end. So basically, it's kind of impossible to pre-compute the risk in all these possible scenarios. Too much. <coughs> this is the result uh, that we have. Once we set out what kind of uh, part of the expression we want uh, and uh, what kind of targets we want to consider in the computation and, uh, and so on, we end up with a color-coded map uh, with uh, a risk and a number associated to the risk. Now, how do we compute it, this efficiently so that since we are basically bound to do an on-the-fly computation, but we have too many data, we have too many variants. Can we do only with SQL views? No, because we would have to generate a million of these SQL views for all the possible combinations of parameters that we have around. So that's not possible. Are we going to use a pure Java process instead? It's going to be uh, very flexible. Not really too much data to transfer from the database to the Java process to do the computation. We are going to die waiting for it to get out of the database. Uh, we are going to do it fully on the fly. Again, no, there's too much data involved. So what we did is a compromise. We pre-compute all buffer and, and see what kind of resources they catch. So we have, a, five minutes, we have a, um, a, um, a larger uh, data set already uh, pre-computed for uh, the aggregation, and we have a process that builds SQL views, but on the fly, uh, taking into account all the variants and parameters that the user specified. I'm going to uh, go a, a bit quicker. Uh, the thing is, we are 
actually doing uh, parametric views in which some parameters are other SQL views themselves. So it gets really complicated. But the thing is, we, we, we managed to get very good performance uh, uh, with, with this setup. And the, the, all the stuff uh, can run either as a WPS process or uh, as a rendering transformation. So it, it displays on the fly what it computes. Uh, we also had to do efficient cross-layer filtering, find me all the uh, uh, cultivated areas that uh, fit in within this buffer. And uh, since we are comparing two layers that are in, in the database, guess what? We used uh, a SQL viewing in this case, right? So we passed the SQL view, the buffer area that we are taking into account, <laughs> and the, 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 the bounds of the, the view that we are uh, looking at, so that the database finds quickly the uh, areas that, we, uh, that are intersecting the buffer. Uh, we also had to, to uh, develop a process to uh, do these 51 buffers on, on top of 500,000 uh, arcs, and uh, we found out that we needed a buffer, uh, a customized version. Um, quickly, uh, another, pr uh, another project, I'm going to fly by on this one. This project is uh, completely different. We made it for NATO. Uh, they are doing naval exercises in the Medi Mediterranean Sea. And uh, these naval exercises produce a lot of noise, which uh, can um, confuse uh, marine uh, mammals, dolphins, and uh, whales, and so on. So they have to pay attention to that. So they have this sound propagation model, which is an octave model that computes the sound propagation in the in the water, and the geo server is actually calling it via WPS. Uh, but it's it's interesting because the process not, does not only call Octave, but it also logs into a, WF, a WFS feature type all the details about that request so that we can use WFS to list which uh, computations were made, when, by whom, with which with parameter, and uh, extract uh, uh, the result and uh, display it on a map, and eventually decide to delete it. So it's, it's a, again, a creative uh, a uh, creative approach to how do I get more status out of an asynchronous request. Plus, uh, we have to make uh, a comparison between raster layers, so we needed a fast raster algebra. And uh, uh, we made a, a simple version that uses a, an OGC filter. And then we have a, a fully um, freeform version that uses this GFOL library that you can find online which is a, a very, very fast implementation of a raster algebra in Java. I say very fast because the thing is, you write your own math, uh, your own conditions, your own mul multiplication, uh, uh, trigonometric function calls, and so on. And it first turns that thing into bytecode, and then the virtual machine turns it into native code. Uh, that is, if you are computing a, a large area, r it really runs like it was written in C after a few seconds. So it's really quick. And uh, this is an example of how the syntax looks like. Um, let me see just a, a final example quickly about uh, scripting instead of uh, a process. So in this case, I'm starting with a, a, this is a sample application. It's not real world, but it gives you an idea. I have a land use map. I want to get uh, the percentages, the distribution of percentages of land use within a polygon that I draw on the map. And uh, the result should be a chart. So simple one, right? But we don't have a built-in process that does this. So the idea is that we have this shape file. And someone wrote a, uh, a Python code to do the aggregation to compute the, the result that is being displayed on the map. And uh, this is all the code that was needed to be written to have a new process in GeoServer show up from Python code, which I find, personally, it's quite good because it's re relatively compact. And uh, as I said, you can iterate on top of it because GeoServer reloads the Python code if it notices it has been modified. And uh, this is an example in Jiton, but as I said, you can uh, use uh, lots of other scripting languages. And um, yeah, this is it.
Yes. Um, is it able to cancel a process? No, it's not at the moment. Uh, so we have uh, some sort of supporting at uh, the API level <coughs> to cancel a process, but uh, uh, nowadays none of the processes that we have written so far is cancelable. Okay. And also, uh, you say you can get the status of the process, but is that a literal 20%, 30% going on status? Or is it that depends all, again on who coded the process. Some processes can give back uh, uh, some estimate of where they are at yeah. in terms of a percentage, okay. others don't. Getting to link with grass is not uh, a five-minute thing because you have to set up the map set and then uh, you have to export <coughs> the data, run the processes, get get the data back from the map set. So it, it can be done, uh, but it would take uh, at the very least a few days of heavy development to, to do it. Within, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you are writing code, so you're, so you're free to do whatever you want. So, so just to answer that, can you, can you call an external WPS, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Can you call an external WPS process, but then the data gets sent to that WPS process, or the WPS process is... It, it's, uh, it's all in your, in your implementation. You get the data, and once you have it, you can do whatever you want with it. So if you want to ser send it over to a remote service, you can. So there is no capability right now? No, no, no. no. We, we don't have a, a WPS cascading ability at the moment. It could be written, and that also would take uh, a few days of heavy development to be done. Uh, 